Welcome to EPG Patshala. My name is Ipshita Chanda and I teach comparative literature at Jadavpur University. In this module, we will be talking about the poems of Dennis Brutus, a poet activist of South Africa. During this talk, we will also be considering the apartheid situation in South Africa and how that influenced creative literary production there. Let us begin with an overview of the life of Dennis Brutus. Dennis Brutus was born in Harare, Zimbabwe in the year 1924 of South African colored parents and he grew up in the Eastern Cape town of Port Elizabeth. During the middle of the 20th century, Brutus was one of the foremost poets associated with the literature of protest against apartheid in South Africa. His most discussed poems are political lyrics. He died in Cape Town in 2009. Let us consider this genre of political lyric which is unique to Dennis Brutus. These lyrics are intensely personal poems that focus on the poli fundamental political issues in South Africa during the middle of the 20th century. The over of Dennis Brutus comprises poems in which he brings out the feelings of his oppressed countrymen in an apartheid-ridden state. His early poems show how racism had permeated every aspect of South African life through a personal account of how it affected his life and education in South Africa. For instance, Brutus trained as a lawyer in Witwatersrand University but was not allowed to practice in South Africa because he was colored. The expression of this intensely personal experience of race was however also the experience of the segregated South African society as a whole. This is why his poems are called political lyrics, though in general we do not bring these two genre descriptions together. That Dennis Brutus was able to join the lyrical with the political testifies to his poetic ability. Brutus was interested in activities related to sports, which brought him face to face with the politics of racism in South Africa. Sports is, is an activity that should have remained divorced from politics, but in South Africa, things were different with op apartheid an official policy adopted by the South African government. Brutus was completely disillusioned with this policy of racial segregation that was being practiced even within the arena of sports. By this policy of racial separation, the whites were provided better opportunities and facilities in sports activities. Brutus was instrumental in founding the South African Sports Association in 1959 in order to overcome racial discrimination. Initially, the government ignored his activities. Ultimately, they banned him both from politics and from writing. He was also not permitted to hold on to his teaching position when he tried to organize a colored national con convention in 1961. During this time, the government had the power to arrest and hold anyone without trial. In 1963, Brutus, even though he was banned, had attended the meeting of the South African Olympic Committee held at Johannesburg. Immediately, he was arrested but was released on bail. He escaped to Mozambique, where he was arrested again by the Portuguese colonial authority and was sent back to South Africa. As his recapture was not made public, his relatives and friends did not know where he was and the government was free to do with him whatever they wished. This opportunity was taken by the South African Bureau of State Security. Brutus attempted to escape and was shot in the back. After his recovery, he was sentenced to 18 months imprisonment in the dreaded Robben Island. What is apartheid? We need to understand this because it is central to Brutus's poetic sensibility. 
It was under this condition of political, social, and economic repression as practiced by the state that the literary activity of Brutus came to the fore. The repressive legislation in South Africa had hindered the work of the literary artist. Various acts were passed which had censorship provisions revealing the South African government's desire to control the freedom of expression among the people. For instance, there were the Entertainment Censorship Act of 1931, the Customs Act of 1955, the Extension of University Education Act of 1959, Unlawful Organizations Act 1960, Publication and Entertainments Act 1963, General Law Amendment Act, also 1963. All these acts reveal how the public in general and the literary artist in particular had to work under an extremely stifling socio-political environment. The Publications Control Board not only decided what could be published but also kept a watch on the activities of the writers. Hence, the content of the book did not always determine the possibility of its publication within the apartheid state. Under the given condition, it becomes amply clear that the writer cannot remain in an ivory tower or detached from the plight of the people and the injustice faced by them every day. This is the background of Brutus's major works. They give voice to the oppression of the people in South Africa due to the policy of racial segregation. They contain a sense of agony and frustration in the face of separation and violence, mental and physical. These relate the sufferings of the people who are victims of this policy of apartheid to the poet's personal experience of arrests, harassments and imprisonments. In his poems, one witnesses his social responsibility as a South African poet. As Brutus had once remarked, I think it is simply true that an artist, a writer, is a man who lives in a particular society and takes his images and ideas from that society. South Africa under apartheid was almost like a prison state whose only aim was to create a white utopia by controlling and repressing the people of other races. So, as Brutus says, in the condition of socio-political repression to which the South Africans were subjugated, the work of the literary artist is bound to express the very same suffering and oppression. The literary artist and the activist in South Africa consider it their responsibility to show the world the actual reality of the apartheid state. This is what Brutus does in all the collections of poems that he published. In 1963, while Brutus was sentenced to imprisonment at Robin Island, his first collection of poems was published by Mbari Press in Nigeria. This collection was called Sirens, Knuckles, Boots. As the name suggests, the poems in this collection show the atrocities of the apartheid regime and how it represses the people, both physically and mentally. The apartheid state did not permit the political prisoners to write, but personal correspondence was permitted. Brutus used this leeway to write poems in the form of letters to his sister-in-law, Martha. Thus, letters to Martha and other poems from, South, from a South African prison were published. After his release from prison, Brutus was under house arrest and his activities were tremendously curtailed. During this time, the South African government began to issue cancelled permits in order to get rid of politically undesirable people. These permits were given to people for a one-way ticket outside South Africa so that they could not return. Brutus took advantage of this and with his family he went into exile. Brutus became active in anti-apartheid protests all over the world. He was the founder and became the president of the South African Non-Racial Olympic Committee, also known as Sandrock. 
He was instrumental in effecting South Africa's expulsion from the Olympic Games because of its policy of racial segregation in sports. This shows Brutus's intimate association with South African politics even while he was in exile. He went across the world with a political agenda against apartheid. He translated his experiences from these travels into poetry. His collection of verse, poems from Algiers, was one such collection which deals with his experience of what it means to be an artist and a South African. The book was published in 1970. The next collection of poems called China Poems was published in 1975. In contrast to his earlier poetry, which maintained the simplicity of both form and structure, the China poems show a marked adherence to the haiku style of verse. It is generally considered that Brutus came in touch with the haiku style during his stay in Beijing. The poems which he wrote during the 1980s also deal with political issues. But in these poems, Brutus no longer remained limited to the political problems of South Africa. He widened his vision to include the state of other tumultuous countries like Nicaragua and Chile. Apart from these, other poems written during this period were poetic praises to Brutus's political heroes like Nelson Mandela and Oliver Tambo. The protest poetry of Brutus grows out of the apartheid state of South Africa. He uses various genres of poetry to protest against the atrocities of this state. The majority of his poems are shorn of all poetic ornamentation and speak directly to the readers since it is his purpose to make them connect with his experiences in a racially segregated South Africa and understand what it means to live under racial segregation. Making the readers conscious of the history of his people is one of the concerns of this poet. Most of his poems are marked by brevity of style and an intense power of observation. There is a personal manner in which the poet speaks in his poems and the terse and direct use of language addresses the readers more powerfully than ordinary speech. The imagery Brutus uses brings the material reality of an oppressive regime and the heroic resistance that gives human dignity to those who bear and challenge its atrocities. In the poems of Brutus reverberate the deep and sincere voices of individuals for whom the value of freedom is of utmost importance. His poems reveal a struggle to become free and thereby live with complete human dignity. The poetic voice never stops itself from accusing and questioning the immorality of apartheid. Brutus wants to awaken the anger of oppressed people in such a manner that they protest and act against racial discrimination. Let us turn to individual poems to see how this is achieved by the poet. We will discuss here four specific poems of ta Brutus taken from two different collections. This choice has been influenced by the popularity of the poem and how far it reveals Brutus's concern for the situation in apartheid South Africa. We will begin by discussing the poem the sounds begin again from Siren's Knuckles Boots. The sounds begin again, the siren in the night, the thunder at the door, the shriek of nerves in pain. This poem makes us feel the experience of racial discrimination and oppression by translating it into a lyric cry, a process which is central to many of Brutus's poems. This is heard by the reader through a chain of sounds that move towards the center of the self. The sound of the siren leads to the thunder at the door and this in turn tears through the entire being and one can hear the very physical but the silent sound of the shriek of nerves in pain.
These sound images bring to the fore the frequent raids of the South African security police in the residential areas or the townships of the black and colored South Africans in the darkness of the night. During these raids, the sirens of the police vans rent the air. Immediately afterwards follow the knock at the door and then the physical blows signaling atrocities and torture. And the result? Then the keening crescendo of faces split by pain. The poem powerfully presents this movement of sounds and the final explosion of sounds translates this physical torture into a lyric cry. There is a subtle but important change between the first and the last line of the poem. The sounds begin again in the first line of the poem, changes to my sounds begin again in the last. This change brings out the process of internalization where the sounds of raids and torture results of the state's suppression of its citizens through the speaker's personal sufferings become my sounds. The process of internalization is the dynamic force that brings this poem into being. And this is an instance of how Brutus brings together lyricism with the political. The next poem we consider is what do they expect from me? In what do they expect from me? The poet in an earnest voice answers the question asked and challenges those compatriots who are losing the drive to go on with the struggle against apartheid. When the poet exhorts them to pursue the lines that brought me where I am, they shrink or find excuse. Although his voice shows frustration and disappointment, the poet does not hesitate to express his determination and faith in those fighters who will not waver from their duty and will carry on the fight against apartheid loyally. Thus the poem sustains a hope in the face of all odds. This hope and optimism are melded in Brutus's poems with the stark reality of a fascist apartheid regime. However, it is not only pain and oppression, but also hope and love that Brutus's poetry speaks of. In Hold Me, My Dear, Hold Me, one finds this sense of optimism in the face of the torture and hardship that the poet experiences in prison. He expresses the positive qualities of humanity to his readers and the images express the faith he has in the power of love to combat the oppressive nature of apartheid. Thus he declares, let me be assured of this, amid the buffets of metal is still a possible tenderness. This feeling of tenderness is a recurrent one in many of the poems of Brutus. Tenderness is an emotional quality which is essential for poetry and also for the survival of humanity. As Brutus says, somehow we survive and tenderness, frustrated, does not wither. The experience of tenderness amidst all the carnage is important and it announces the revival of human life. The poem then lists a series of oppressive injustices unleashed by the apartheid regime on the people. Investigating searchlights rake our naked, unprotected contours. Boots club the peeling door. The poem ends with a little variation of the beginning line. But somehow, tenderness survives. The survival of tenderness leads to the survival of a human voice in apartheid South Africa. Brutal torture has scarred the land with terror and has made the land and the people unlovely and unlovable. Yet, tenderness can survive. And from this comes the hope that the power of tenderness will one day decimate the atrocities of apartheid policy. In the poem, a common hate enriched our love and us. Taken from the collection, A Simple Lust, the poet says, 
hate gouged out deeper levels of our passion. A common hate enriched our love and us. The poem thus changes the torment of apartheid into an aesthetic of pain and heartbreaking hope in the power of love. Another poem, perhaps, brings out the transient nature of imprisonment. It reveals hope and it assures the people that if they have faith in themselves, they can achieve a future in which they will have what they are now deprived of. What exists at the present time is nothing in comparison to what they deserve. Thus, the poem subtly urges the people to fight for their rights with a positive hope. The poem Mob, also from A Simple Lust, describes a white mob attacking a group of black protesters and unleashing violence upon them. The poet here tries to weld his community together by transforming the brutality of the whites and the violence against blacks into passion. In the face of the discriminatory policy adopted by the apartheid state, Brutus desires to bind the community into a single unit. One can thus understand that although Brutus is writing poems protesting against apartheid, Yet, the poems are not all bleak and dark, under the burden of suffering, pain and racial discrimination. There is hope and a positive spirit that articulates a promise for better times and a faith in humanity. The poems of Letters to Martha are perfect examples of unadorned poems which have the power to capture and represent the horrors of imprisonment in apartheid South Africa. These poems are bereft of artifice and have an intensely sincere and honest voice that show the poet's desire for freedom, not for himself alone, but for all his countrymen. The first few poems describe extreme fear that exists within the prison cells. This constant fear factor that the apartheid government successfully inculcates within the political prisoners kills the individuals mentally and psychologically before they are killed physically. After the sentence articulates this fear, as it says, when the prisoners hear of the load of approaching days and the brutal treatment in prisons, they are told that the only consoling factor is the knowledge of those who endure much more and endure. From this fear, Brutus also stresses on the fact that the prisoners are separated from the world of nature inside the prisons, and this creates a claustrophobic situation. In Letters to Martha, poem number 17, stresses this when the poet says, the complex aeronautics of the birds and their exuberant aerobatics become matters for intrigued speculation and wonderment. Natural things like the birds and their flight become rare as prisoners are kept in seclusion and in hostile confinement. The picture of the birds flying high is in direct contrast with the situation of the prisoners whose freedom and movement is violently curtailed. The very picture of the free birds makes the prisoners desirous of freedom and they understand the value of being free. Poem number 18 from this collection also presents a similar situation where the prisoner who wants to see the stars clearly through, the, through his prison window turns off the corridor light as it hinders his view of the sky. This audacity calls the guard forth and the angry words of the guard are what the prisoner remembers. As Brutus says, it is the brusque enquiry and threat that I remember of that night rather than the stars. This remark epitomizes both physical and mental violence and the brutality that the non-white population in apartheid South Africa underwent. In another poem, On the Island, one, the poet says, cement gray walls and floors, cement gray days, cement gray time, and a gray Saceration. The poem reveals the loneliness of the prisoner 
On the other hand, the repetition of the words cement grey represents the completely bleak, emotionless and death-like coldness of the prison cells. It also brings out the monotonous and stagnant life of the prisoner, depriving him of his human qualities. This situation is emphasized in the last line of this poem. One is locked in a grey, gelid stream of unmoving time. While in exile, Brutus constantly wrote for the tortured and oppressed people of South Africa. In the poem, in the dove grey, dove soft dusk, which comes from a simple lust, Brutus talks of the agonizing, poignant, urgent, simple desire, simply to stroll in the quiet dusk. Since he is in exile and therefore free, he can fulfill this wish of his, but at the same time, he feels for his fellow blacks back home who could not satisfy their simple desires, as I do now and they do not. The last two poems we discuss in this module are I am the Exile and A Troubadour I Traverse All My Land, both taken from A Simple Lust, published in 1985. There is a similarity between both these poems, as we find that in both of them, the poet compares himself with a troubadour, but with a change in role. The troubadour of old sang of love for his mistress and traveled from one place to another. But here in apartheid South Africa, the poet sings of his love for his country, from which he is forced to part because of the resistance to its policies of exclusion and violence. In the first poem, the poet says that this troubadour seems apparently calm and gentle. He maintains the visage of servility, but the depth of his heart is filled with the sounds of wailing, and in his head he hears the cries and the sirens. Thus, the poet compares his situation with that of the troubadour. In the present condition, in South Africa, the sounds of the sirens, the torture and the cries of pain are the only sounds that the troubadour can hear and write about. The traditional element of love for his mistress is now altered. The troubadour now sings of his love for his country. Thus, in the second poem, the poet says, No mistress favour has adorned my breast, only the shadow of an arrow brand. The Troubadour's song in the present time tells not of Cupid's arrow, but of the prisoner's arrow brand. This is the paradox between the traditional Troubadour singing of his love for his mistress and the present day poet singing of his love for his country. Hence, the poet successfully transfers the love that exists between the lover and his mistress within the codes of chivalry to that which exists between an individual and his country from which he has been exiled because of opposition to the policy of apartheid. Though Brutus is writing poems of revolt and protest, they are free from cliched descriptions. The imagery used is startling and direct and has the power to drive home subtly but emphatically the condition of the non-whites in apartheid South Africa. Brutus's success is the quality of his imagery and his controlled use of language. There is no excess nor any exaggeration in his descriptions of prison life or the violence that is unleashed upon the people in South Africa. The poetry of Dennis Brutus keeps alive the memory of the violent injustice that the non-whites in South Africa were victims of before the apartheid regime was dismantled. Brutus speaks against the wrongs committed by the apartheid regime, but he does so in a re restrained voice. By doing this, he appeals to the sense of right inherent in every individual in a country where the rights of many have been denied for long. Thus, his poetry gives the opportunity to assert one's humanity
and he speaks scathingly about the apartheid policy which dehumanizes the individual. If you want to re read more of Brutus's poetry, you can refer back to the e-text, which will also give you a deeper insight into the world that he addresses through his poetry. Thank you.